After roughly 20 years of peace, the world went to war for a second time. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be exploring how World War II began. The Second World War is considered a direct result of the First World War due to unresolved tensions and anger from that conflict. However, the Great Depression of the 1930s was another factor that led to bitterness and a shift in public attitudes towards strict dictatorships. World War I also facilitated the rise of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party. Hitler's allies in Italy and Japan also acted aggressively with the hope of expanding their territories. Hostilities by these countries towards the communism of the Soviet Union was just another factor that helped lead to war. In fact, a number of ideologies helped spark the war. Aggressive expansionism by countries like Germany and Italy, fascist dictatorships, and deep-seated racism were all considered contributing factors. This racism was mostly in Germany, where the Nazis believed the Aryan race was the master race and superior to the Slavic people. The countries that eventually formed the Allied Alliance acted passively in the face of the Axis threat. This was partly out of sympathy, partly out of guilt because of the Treaty of Versailles that blamed the Germans for World War I, and partly because countries like Britain underestimated Hitler. Meanwhile, the League of Nations proved itself ineffective in the fight to keep the peace. A few months after Japan withdrew from the League of Nations in 1933, Germany did the same. In 1935, Germany violated the Treaty of Versailles by introducing mandatory military conscription and by beginning rearmament. That country continued to violate the treaty in the years that followed. In fact, in 1936, Hitler remilitarized the Rhineland. It was around this time Nazi Germany formed their important alliance with Italy. Soon after, the two countries offered support to the separatist movement in the Spanish Civil War, while the existing government was supported by the Soviet Union. These events foreshadowed the Second World War as both sides were testing different methods and weapons of battle. One specific event that foretold the horrors of World War II was the April 1937 bombing of Guernica. By 1938, Hitler's motives were clearer. In a move referred to as the Anschluss, the Nazis annexed Austria into Germany, despite the fact this also violated the Treaty of Versailles. Later that year, Hitler was appeased by both Britain and France when they signed the Munich Agreement. This allowed Hitler to overtake a German-speaking section of Czechoslovakia in order to keep the peace. In August 1939, Nazi Germany signed a peace treaty with the Soviet Union. However, the first official event of World War II followed soon after. Due to long-standing tensions, Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939. Britain and France warned Germany that should the troops not withdraw, war was imminent. When the Nazis did nothing, Britain and France declared war on Germany and World War II officially began. Of course, a little short little video there, of course, on how World War II uh, broke out, of course, in 1939, of course, which I, of course, talk a lot about th this week, of course, uh, the topic of the Second World War. So, you know, welcome you back, of course, Daniel Simon at BRCC, of course, uh, week seven, pretty much the last major week I'll have, of course, of lectures uh, in the summer semester, of course. Uh, I know we have, like, one more week next week, of course, week eight, like, finals coming up and all that, but... Anyway, um, looks like I've got a bunch of students I know watching live right now uh, online. Looks like I know on YouTube we've got Mackenzie. Good morning. Uh, I had a great weekend, uh, by the way. Uh, Nadia, good morning. Also, hey, Joy, what's going on? Uh, also, Daisy, on keys. Hey, what's up? Uh, of course, Shanda uh, Haynes also joining us this morning. Uh, Samantha, and also looks like Markella is also joining us as well uh, this morning. So, yeah, interesting topic this week, of course, World War II. Uh, of course, one of the major events that really changed a lot, you know, about the world in general. I know it totally changed Europe, I know, afterwards, of course. We'll get to that later. But um, anyway, I did want to talk about a few announcements before I get started today. I know we have a bunch of assignments which are still out right now. I know these are the major assignments that I've got out right now with the class. The British quiz, you know, that. Number four, uh, I think you need to kind of you know wrap that up this week because uh, I think that, I think it's due tonight. I thought I, I might give you more time on it. You know, may, I'll kind of take a look at it tonight and see where everybody's at with that one. Might leave it open a little bit longer if you want. But uh, of course, second exam due at the end of the week. That's something you need to get get done because there's gonna be a, some of you are gonna have to take the final coming up. Of course, uh, World War One quiz that last Canvas quiz number five. That one's still out for a while. 
Uh, so that one's, I think, due at the end of the week, but I might give you more time on that one. Third, vocab is also due uh, at the end of the week uh, as well. Uh, other assignments coming up, too. I know next week, week eight during finals, uh, your book report is due. Don't forget about that major assignment that's out. Uh, also, there will be a final exam, those that have to take it. Some of you will be exempt from the final if you have a high grade, and high A uh, in the class. But our final is going to be on uh, World War I, Rise of Fascism, and then World War II. Uh, we'll have some recorded lectures later this week I'll have of course, on the Cold War era, which I'll probably have, a, I'm going to have a bonus quiz on that separate for extra credit uh, toward the semester. Uh, so that's going to be something that uh, you can take, you know, if you need extra points uh, at, in the semester. I'll talk about later in the week, but I think I'm going to have like some kind of makeup period coming up. I usually do uh, during finals. Uh, so if you're behind by on an assignment, I'll probably give you at least a week to kind of make it up uh, as well. So anyway, I'm going to get, of course, to the main thing today and also tomorrow, which uh, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, you know, World War II, the Second World War, which is really a major topic, you know, in the 20th century. It's, of course, one of the most destructive conflicts in human history. Uh, the amount of deaths, you know, in World War II was somewhere as maybe high as like 50, 60 million people that died, uh, like just in a six-year period, uh, which is amazing. Uh, of course, maybe two or three times more, you know, destructive than, say, World War I was. I'll talk about the outbreak of the war, uh, the early stages of the war, uh, especially from 1939 up to about 1941. I'll probably cover at least up to discussing uh, how the United States entered World War II uh, because of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So if you have any comments, questions during the live stream, you know, let me know, uh, or you can always leave me, of course, comments later on my channel. You can also subscribe below uh, as well. All right. So uh, anyway, um, I want to go ahead and first, like I said, talk about the background of the early stages, you know, of World War II, uh, which, you know, a lot of it had to do with Nazi Germany. They're, of course, the main aggressor that really uh, caused World War II to break out uh, in Europe. Uh, there's Hitler right there. Of course, we had already talked about the rise of Nazi Germany under Hitler. You know, Hitler took power in 1933. And so within like five, six years, you know, we're basically back to another world war, like, of course, it was uh, in World War One. we talked about before. Uh, so I'll kind of kind of talk about, you know, what were some of the things that really led up to before. We kind of already talked about, you know, all those things where Germany rearmed and the West did really nothing to really appease uh, Hitler. I'll kind of first talk about uh, I kind of see here, I'll get to like the invasion of Poland, which is one of the major events that really leads to why, you know, World War II broke out uh, in Europe. But prior to that, Hitler uh, made this deal uh, with uh, Italy, who was, you know, becoming one of, you know, Germany's closest allies uh, in Europe at the time. Uh, it was called the Pact of Steel, uh, which you can see was signed on May 22nd, 1939. It was actually this military political pact or alliance that was made between the two fascist states, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Uh, it was actually a 10 year deal. It was supposed to last until, I think, 1949 between the countries. Uh, and um, of course, even though that happened, if you know about this, uh, fascist Italy did not really enter the war at first, like when. Nazi Germany invaded Poland. Uh, they would hold off until 1940 when the Germans invaded France. Uh, and so they'll come into the war later. But they do think that the one thing about the Pact of Steel, I guess that, that's kind of important. It creates the Axis powers in Europe is one thing. It also creates the uh, what they call the Tripartite Pact, which kind of bring, bring in, it bring in uh, Japan as well, because uh, Japan was kind of worried about the Soviet Union uh, their aggression in the Far East, you know, because I think Japan wanted to control like Korea, get into Manchuria, they're in Manchuria at the time, actually. Uh, and um, and so that kind of eventually creates this alliance in 1940 between those three powers. And that's the major powers that were really in basically the so-called Axis powers that they have later. They do have other countries that are in the Axis powers too, like Romania, Hungary, I think of Bulgaria, but they're kind of like minor players that are that are also there uh, as well. 
chest, the Pact of Steel. Uh, they also got this thing called the Molotov-Rippentrop Pact, uh, which um, that was this uh, alliance that formed between uh, like a kind of a <clears throat> non-aggression pact alliance between Nazi Germany uh, and the Soviet Union. It's got all kinds of names. Uh, usually the Soviet German non-aggression pact is one name they call it. Uh, they also call it the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact because of the fact that the two foreign ministers of the Soviet Union, uh, he had uh, Yakislav Molotov, uh, and then they had the German foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop. He was the one that was they helped to kind of bring those two countries together. And so they agreed to this 10 year deal from 1939 to 1949, where Germany and the Soviet Union wouldn't fight war against each other. Uh, and so uh, part of the deal, if you know about it, was they agreed to split Poland up because Germany was already planning to go and invade Poland and take it. Uh, and so they agreed to basically give uh, the Soviets the eastern half of Poland and also to allow them to control the Baltic states like Lithuania, Latvia, uh, Estonia, in those areas. And I think the Germans would maybe have a sphere of influence later with Finland, I think it was too, uh, they believe. And uh, the whole reason why Hitler wanted this deal with the Soviets was he was kind of concerned that the Germans would have to fight a two-front war like they did in World War I. And so by creating this, this, this neutrality pact, if you want to call it that, uh, with uh, the Soviet Union, they wouldn't have to worry about fighting a two-front war. And I think at the beginning of the war, there was a deal where the Soviets even helped supply the Germans during the beginning of the war uh, with, I guess, oil and other things like that. Here's other, uh, of course, images here. Uh, that's uh, Rippentrop you see right there next to Stalin on the left. Uh, and so, yeah, Stalin's like, yeah, I won't have to fight Hitler for until 1949. Yay. Of course, that proved to be wrong. Uh, of course, we'll see later because uh, <laughs> uh, Hitler, Hitler and Nazi Germany, of course, will invade you know, Soviet Union in June of 1941. So we'll talk about that, of course, later. Here's kind of a map showing you, too, by the way, uh, the different areas of influence, I guess. So you can see the western part. That would be basically where the Germans would control. And then you can see there uh, <clears throat> the Soviets would control Poland and, of course, also the Baltic states uh, as well. Now, of course, the next thing that happens, you know, that, that follows that really leads into, you know, World War II uh, is the Nazi invasion of Poland. Nazi Germany invades Poland in uh, September of 1939, uh, pretty much the main cause of why World War II breaks out uh, overall. And um, they had been planning this for several months, like going back to the spring, they think of uh, 1939, uh, I think they have actual an invasion plan. They called it Fall Vice or Case White is what it was called. And uh, the Germans uh, plan to invade Poland from multiple angles. I'll kind of show you. Uh, I think I've got some images. There's, of course, a newspaper image of Britain and France declaring war uh, on Germany, of course, when they do invade Poland, which I think there was a promise made between the Western allies and Poland that if Hitler went in there. They they wouldn't do like happened with like Czechoslovakia uh, in the Sudetenland. But you can see here's the invasion uh, plan. You can see like in the west uh, western part there with Poland. Uh, you can see that the Germans invaded from really three angles uh, from basically the western part of Greater Germany, East Prussia, and it also invaded from where Czechoslovakia was. And so you can see that Poland really did not have, have a chance at all. And then you see the Soviets came in uh, from the east. September 17th, Soviets began to occupy uh, the eastern part uh, as, the, as the Germans invade from the west. Uh, and, you know, the west didn't declare war on the Soviet Union. Why was that? There's kind of a debate about why that happened, but some people think there was a secret agreement made with the Poles government not to do that. I don't think they wanted to fight all those different powers either. And um, and so that that basically, you know, ends up leading to, to that, of course, happening. So that causes basically 
uh, France and Britain declare war on Germany September 3rd, 1939. And so that's, I guess, really when the war really starts to widen, of course, after that. And Poland fell fast. I think Poland fell in like a month uh, and all that. Part of why that is, uh, the, the Germans use a new form of offensive warfare you may have heard about called Blitzkrieg, uh, which is what a lot of the newspapers, I think, called it back in those days. And uh, Blitzkrieg was a type of offensive style warfare where they use like mobilized forces, like tanks, trucks, uh, lots of air power. Uh, Blitzkrieg means in German lightning war. Uh, I think Hitler didn't really like the term being used. He thought it was kind of ridiculous, but it's a term they use a lot at the beginning of the war. And for two or three years, uh, if you know about it, the the Germans were almost unbeatable uh, on the battlefield with this new kind of form of offensive warfare, which was different from World War I, which was more defensive type warfare, uh, if you know about that. Uh, There was a German general named Heinz Guderian. He was considered the father of the Blitzkrieg. He's the one that kind of uh, wrote this book called Achtung, I think it's called Achtung Panzer, I think it's called, uh, where he talks about the importance of the tank being used uh, in warfare. So tanks became very vital in, in, in World War II uh, and along with mobilized forces, but they still had to, to, to move like a lot of supplies around artillery sometimes with like horses and stuff like that. Yeah, they used a lot of, you know, aircraft and bomb targets and things like that uh, and so on. Uh, Here's, of course, after, you know, after, you know, Poland fell and all that, you can see that's occupied uh, by these different powers afterwards. And eventually the the Germans will take all of Poland and they'll even try to take over Eastern Europe uh, when when the Germans invade, of course, into um, the Soviet Union in June of 41. Now, I'm going to talk about also this other event that happened, too, uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, which is called the phony war. It's kind of a weird part of uh, World War II they sometimes talk about, uh, which lasted about eight months. Uh, It's not really spelled wrong, the name. uh, I think the British kind of coined it, and that's how they spell the word phony uh, with an E. I know in America they spell phony without an E, so you'll see it spelled either way. It was actually an eight-month lull that occurred in World War II uh, between 1939 and 1940 where Both sides, Axis versus the Allies, didn't really fight each other uh, for a bunch of months. Uh, There was even a case where some people thought that the war was going to be over and that Hitler only wanted Poland uh, and all that. They had different nicknames they called. The Germans called it the Sitzkrieg or Sit Down or Sitting War. I think the French called it the Funny War because it was kind of a strange war uh, during that period. Uh, they were, there were some events that happened. I know the fall of Poland was the beginning of it, I know, of the phony war. Uh, and then uh, there was a case where they fought some naval engagements, like in the Atlantic. Uh, and then also you'll see later that Hitler decides to go into Scandinavia. He invades Denmark uh, and also into Norway as well. And then they had this other event that was kind of weird that happened uh, that during the war. They had the so-called Winter War uh, that happened where uh, the Soviet Union fought uh, against Finland, uh, and um, it lasts from November of 1939 to about March of 1940. And um, those two tangled because uh, the Soviet Union uh, had gone into um, what is uh, the Baltic states, which is right right below Finland. So they're kind of concerned about that. Uh, and then I think there's also this deal where... Um, We'll get to it later, but it actually influences Hitler to go and to invade in Soviet Union because uh, what happened was the Soviets had a trouble trying to fight the Finns because uh, of the winter conflict, and they weren't really their military wasn't really, I guess, ready for the war. Um, in fact, I think Hitler had, I mean, not Hitler, uh, Stalin had purged a lot of the top generals uh, in his military. So they're kind of weak, and um, they fought over this uh, isthmus called the Karelian. Uh, isthmus, which is right above St. Petersburg, and um, which they call Leningrad under the Soviet Union. And um, Finland uh, wanted to push closer to that territory and control it, and the Soviets wanted to push them back. But fin- Finland's interesting in the war. Finland, uh, if you know about it, kind of switches sides in the war. Uh, they a- Actually, when, when Germany invades the Soviet Union, uh, they actually back the Germans. 
uh, against Soviets, uh, I think up to like 1944. And then I think when uh, the Germans started losing, they switched back to the Allied side uh, at the end of the war. So they kind of go back and forth uh, in the war. But the Winter War did kind of, uh, it kind of uh, influenced uh, Hitler to invade the Soviet Union, thinking that the Soviets were weak, and that proved to be, of course, wrong later. Now, I want to also talk about this. Also, like I said, the Germans invaded uh, into Denmark uh, in Norway. Uh, the reason why they did that was they wanted to control the Baltic Sea uh, in the western part of it. You can see there uh, between Norway and Denmark. And so they seized the Kingdom of Denmark. And then they also, uh, you can see, took Norway crossing the Baltic Sea as well. Uh, they also wanted to control uh, Norway because Sweden, which was neutral in the war, had a lot of natural resource like iron ore uh, and all that. And so that would enable them to control a lot of these sources. And I think also they could use Norway to attack, uh, you know, Britain and things like that and prevent the supply of the Soviet Union uh, during the war, which it kind of helped uh, as well. That's, that's kind of something that happened. They did have this deal where apparently in Norway they put in this Nazi collaborator you may have heard about named Vid Vidkin Quisling, uh, and he headed up the government for like four or five years uh, under the Nazi regime. So he was kind of like this Norwegian pro-Nazi guy. And uh, in Norway, and I think in, like, I think today in Europe, whatever, they call it Quisling, someone who's a traitor. Uh, and so after, I think after the war, uh, he was uh, put on trial for treason. I think they executed him after the war, uh, Quisling. Uh, then, of course, the other thing that happened, the, the big thing that occurs next uh, is that the Germans then invaded the West. Uh, they'll, they'll eventually attack the West, which the West, uh, they call it different names, the Western Campaign, Battle of France or Fall of France, of course, will fall, uh, of course, occur in 1940. And um, the Germans had a, a, a plan to invade the West, which they had been working on over the winter. It has a lot of different names uh, that it was called. <clears throat> um, I think the common name they call it is um, Fall Gelb, or if you want the uh, German uh, name of the operation, it was called Case Yellow, which would be the invasion of the West, which would include like the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France. All that would fall to the Nazi Germany uh, in the spring of 1940. Uh, and uh, this General you see on the left is uh, Eric von Manstein. He was considered to be one of uh, the Nazi Germany's best generals, uh, Manstein. And uh, he wrote a book later called Lost Victories. And he was known later for having a lot of uh, conflict with Hitler over the war. In fact, Hitler later fired him in 1944, if you know about this, because uh, he thought Hitler was trying to control the war and didn't really know what he was doing. Uh, and uh, But Manstein had his own plan, which was to basically take the German forces uh, and attack through the Ardennes Forest, through Belgium. Uh, and um, they had different nicknames. I think they called it the um, Operation Sickle Snip, Snip which meant um, sickle, sickle Cut or something like that, that you see uh, in that picture. And so they're going to break through uh, the Ardennes Forest in, the, in Belgium and northern France and it cut the Allies in half, which is the British and French forces. Uh, and uh, you can see it was kind of opposite of the Schlieffen plan. One was the Schlieffen plan you see in that map. And then you got plan two, which was to drive the forces up towards Calais, uh, close to where the uh, English Channel is and all that. And so that actually proved to be uh, some of that actually worked. And a lot of people didn't think they could drive through the Ardennes Forest, which was this forest that was like in part of Belgium and northern France, uh, that you didn't have too many good roads that ran through it. But the Germans ended up putting like 80% of their tanks through there. Uh, and so that was kind of a surprise uh, to the Allies. Uh, and uh, the British were up in Belgium and the French were right below along the, what they call the Maginot Line, uh, which was a defense line that the French built between the wars. And so they just went around the defenses uh, of basically the French and the British. Here kind of a map showing you where the Germans broke through. Uh, the Germans broke through uh, near the, the French city of Sedan. 
Uh, they call it the Battle of Sedan sometimes, uh, May 1940. Uh, and uh, the Germans broke through there. And then from there, what happened was they then raced toward the English Channel. It's kind of an old map uh, you see there. Got more maps showing you uh, as they drive uh, through uh, up into like northern northern France. Uh, and uh, there was a deal where the French tried to counterattack with this thing called Wagen's Plan, which was named after this uh, French general named Maxime Wagen, which uh, they're going to try to see if they could cut it off uh, with British and French forces. Uh, but what happens is you can see the German forces race up towards Calais uh, on the English Channel. And uh, what ends up happening is the Allied forces get trapped in this huge pocket uh, that's there. And uh, they call it the Dunkirk Pocket, I think is what they dub it later. And some like over a million troops actually get caught in that pocket. Uh, so, so yet yeah, mostly a combination of British expeditionary force and French. Some French army forces get trapped there with the Belgium army gets trapped as well right there. The Belgium kind of tried to fight off the, the Germans, but they, they capitulate on May 28th. They didn't really last long, maybe two, three weeks. Uh, and um, what happened was it forced the um, British troops to evacuate, realizing that they're going to all their forces are going to get wiped out or captured by the Germans. And so the um, British uh, have this evacuation that they dub uh, Operation Dynamo. Uh, the British later dub it the so-called Miracle of Dunkirk, uh, and they call it that because. Uh, the only major city they think could evacuate forces when they had decent ports or whatever was Dunkirk, uh, which was on the northern coast of France uh, next to Belgium. And so within like uh, several days between May 27th to about June 4th, which was about around a week, uh, the uh, Allies were able to evacuate a majority of British troops with some French and you can see about 338,000 troops were able to be evacuated, uh, which was considered a miracle because of the fact that those troops were kind of seen as being important uh, that, you know, would would allow them to leave, allow them to fight later. Uh, of course, they had to leave all their equipment behind. So they lost all of their, you know, tanks, their trucks, uh, horses. I think they shot their horses, uh, things like that. Uh, you can see how the men had to actually line up on the beaches uh, to get out, you know, to wait, wait on, to get on ships that could take them out. And um, the British actually used all kinds of ships, from small yachts and so on. Uh, I guess the destroyers that were brought in, but they lost a lot of planes and also, uh, you know, actual ships of trying to evacuate people. They've made movies about, I think recently there was a movie called Dunkirk that came out a few years ago uh, that kind of shows how difficult it was to get out. Uh, but I think I want to say about 80, 90 percent of their forces uh, survived, uh, the British, but the French later end up losing most of theirs. Now, they have, of course, the other thing that happens, of course, that's very famous. You have the fall of France uh, that follows right afterwards. Uh, the French don't last long. Uh, like really, I guess after Dunkirk fell, another two weeks or so, that was it. Uh, in fact, basically, the French are defeated in a matter of like something like six weeks after that. Uh, part of why that was uh, was the fact that the um, if you study about what occurred was when the Germans invaded northern France, uh, like several million French people that were living there all of a sudden just forced evacuation. They began to move like east to west across France to get away from the Germans. And it created chaos <clears throat> so much that it caused their army to collapse. And so uh, France fell pretty quick <clears throat> after that. You can see images here, of course, of, of Hitler. Hitler actually, his only time he visited Paris, by the way, during the war, of course, was in uh, June, of, June of 1940. There, of course, you can see Hitler visiting the Eiffel Tower. And then also Hitler visited actually the tomb of Napoleon at Lenvilled, of course, in the city. <clears throat> and so uh, Hitler got his revenge against, against the West.
uh, by defeating the French forces, of course, in 1940. So a humiliating defeat for France. It's considered, like, you know, the fall of France is considered to be one of really France's worst defeats uh, in military history. Uh, of course, what happened was, if you know about it, uh, they then forced the French to sign an armistice to end the war. Because France got knocked out of the war uh, in 1940. And so if you know about it, they took that railway car, uh, which the, you know, Germans had been forced to sign the armistice in 1918 uh, at the Forest Compiègne. They actually got it out, and they forced the French to sign an armistice there. Uh, so Hitler, uh, Hitler, I guess, made the um, French eat crow. I think he even had it later uh, blown up, an actual rail car uh, that was signed. He blew it up uh, afterwards. Uh, here's what France looked like afterwards. Uh, France was uh, kind of divided after uh, the Germans uh, defeated the French uh, in 1940. Uh, what occurred was that northern France was actually occupied by the Germans at first. Uh, so um, Paris, uh, believe it or not, became this open city during the war, uh, which was kind of interesting because of the fact that well, I didn't really bomb that much in the war. And so that's why Paris is such an interesting city in Europe, because uh, it wasn't as affected uh, by the war. You know, London, Berlin, et cetera, I guess even maybe Rome were bombed or whatever uh, in the war. But uh, that's one thing about Paris that it's kind of unique <clears throat> about it. Uh, then the southern part was unoccupied, or at least for initially for a couple of years. I think by 1942-43, the Germans eventually took it over, but they did create this unoccupied uh, territory called, of southern France, which was called Vichy France. Uh, Vichy France was this uh, pro-Nazi French state uh, that was set up afterwards. And they put in charge this um, head of state, chief of state, who I have an image of right here, uh, who was Henry Pétain. Pétain was put in uh, the so-called line of Verdun. Uh, he became... Uh, the president of it, uh, the head of state, really chief of state, I guess is what it was. And um, anyway, uh, they put him in power, and he was kind of like a pro-Nazi. Patain was this guy that um, created this authoritarian state uh, that was very conservative. Uh, and um, they even rounded up people like Jews, and they shot a bunch of communists, if you know about that, under Patain. And then uh, the Nazis also forced the um, <clears throat> French to round up Jews, which they did. Uh, and they took a lot of them, they shipped them to the concentration camps uh, in Germany and also Auschwitz. And so maybe as many as like 70,000 Jews or more uh, may have been killed uh, because of uh, Batain. But a lot of it was more due to uh, the Nazis more than anything. Uh, Batain was later seen as a traitor, by the way, after the war. Uh, if you knew about it, he was imprisoned uh, by the French. But uh, the Germans basically kept about 2 million French people as like POWs. And they even forced a lot of the French uh, to work as like forced labor, like they did a lot of people in Europe. And that was the only thing that the, you know, the Germans, and a lot of the French hated the Germans. And uh, they even had a French resistance movement that kind of got started uh, because of the German occupation <clears throat> of France, which lasted for like around four years or so. Uh, also, they had some other generals like de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle uh, was a French general that refused to surrender uh, to the Germans. Uh, and so he fled the country, if you know about this. Uh, and uh, he created this French government in exile, which was called Free France. Uh, it was dubbed, uh, which was based in London, London, England, uh, and it included a, a, a military force that was kind of with the Allied powers that fought with them. And these are all French people that, you know, did like the Nazis, uh, et cetera. And um, they had a military force you see here called the Free French Forces. You can see there, uh, that's them right there with Charles de Gaulle on the left. And uh, they were known for their famous uh, symbol, which was called the Cross of Lorraine. And so... Uh, the Free French uh, would train with the Allied powers. Uh, they would later be involved, you know, in D-Day uh, when they invaded France, the Allies, uh, in 1944. And so de Gaulle would later help 
get France back, you know, from Nazi Germany, which occupies it for several years. Now, I'm going to talk about it next. The, of course, with the French knocked out of the war at that point in 1940, the only country left, you know, the fight uh, Nazi Germany is Britain, Great Britain, uh, the UK at that point. And uh, as that's kind of going on, as the as the French are losing, uh, what ends up happening, Neville Chamberlain uh, is forced to resign because of this embarrassment, you know, about what happens with France falling at that point. Chamberlain was also ill with cancer. Uh, and so what happened in 1940, if you know about it, uh, Winston Churchill came in. He became the prime minister of Britain. And Churchill is considered to be, by the way, one of the greatest, you know, political leaders in World War II. He's up there with, you know, Franklin D. Roosevelt of the Soviet Union, uh, Joseph Stalin, of course, uh, in uh, <clears throat> yeah, Joseph Stalin, of course, of the Soviet Union and all of that. And um, when he came in, which uh, Churchill was appointed prime minister uh, by the by the king uh, in May of uh, May tenth, nineteen forty, uh, was after Neville Chamberlain resigns. And uh, in his first speech, if you know about it, he made this famous comment where he said, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And Churchill was this, you know, politician that had been kind of almost an exile politically uh, going back to World War I because he had not feared during the war. And uh, Churchill had been one of the very few, you know, politicians that kind of warned people about Hitler and the Nazis uh, and so a lot, of, a lot of people in the West have been naive about Hitler. Um, Churchill was also famous for a lot of speeches uh, in World War II, especially around, around at the beginning of the war in 1940. His most famous speech he gave uh, was the We Shall Fight on the Beaches speech, uh, which occurred on June 4th, 1940, the House of Commons. Uh, and um, that occurred after Dunkirk happened, which was considered like a miracle at that point. And so Churchill's kind of, you know, instrumental in rallying the the, the British people uh, against against, you know, the Soviet Union, which he kind of views as almost like like the dark new dark ages uh coming in at that point. Now, I'm going to talk about next the Battle of Britain because the Battle of Britain is really considered to be one of the first major battles that occurs really uh in in World War II, especially after the fall of France at that point. Uh, battle of Britain, if you know a bit about it, it was mostly an air battle uh, that took place between the uh, Royal Air Force of, of Great Britain and, of course, the Luftwaffe, which is, you know, the German Air Force they had, of course, that Hitler had. And um, it took place, by the way, between July to October 1940 is mostly the months that it took place the most. So over a period of like several months uh, overall. <clears throat> and... Um, Battle of Britain, by the way, was kind of considered to be like a uh, attempt by Hitler to either uh, intimidate the British into surrendering uh, their forces uh, or obviously to invade was the other option, to invade Britain and, and of course, knock the British uh, out of the war. Here's kind of a, uh, more pictures of it right here. And so, yeah, the uh, that's why part of why the, you know, the Germans wanted control of France so they could either invade or use their air power to, you know, attack attack Britain, uh, mostly England. Uh, Hitler did have an amphibious invasion operation that they were starting to plan called Operation, it's called Silo, which means in German Sea Lion, which involved amphibious type forces. Uh, but they're not sure how serious Hitler was really about invading. And it never really happened. It was kind of postponed later uh, by Hitler. He was going to come back and invade, but he got involved with the whole, you know, invasion of the Soviet Union uh, later in 1941. And so it never really happened. So obviously taking Britain was a challenge because of the fact that, you know, Britain's an island, uh, you know, uh, the British have a strong Navy. Uh, they have a decent Air Force. Uh, and so that made it really difficult, you know, for uh, the Germans. So it was considered really the first major battle at least in, in, in really helping to turn the war around. Uh, the, the one thing about the RAF, the Royal Air Force, they, they kind of maintain an advantage uh, because the fact that the 
uh, British uh, divided the whole area of England into like air sectors because uh, at the time, you know, radar was starting to kind of be used at that point, uh, which would enable, you know, uh, obviously one side to, to detect incoming enemy aircraft, uh, which they could. And so uh, <clears throat> Fighter Command, RAF Fighter Command, uh, divided into different sectors where they had different airfields. And then so airplane or bombers came in, you know, into certain air sectors. They could then send up, you know, planes to attack them. Yeah, it is one considered one of the first major air battles uh, in history. Uh, like, I think on both sides, they had different types of fighters that were kind of famous because monoplanes become like the typical kind of planes used, uh, of course, in World War II. Uh, the Germans had the ME-109 or Messerschmitt's uh, that was kind of famous, but really the British had the better <clears throat> better uh, fighter planes with the Spitfire, if you know about that. And so that was kind of a major role. But obviously the British had a, had a kind of advantage because uh, they were fighting over England and the, the channel. And so the, the um, Germans had to fly further. You know, they couldn't refuel and things like that. And so that's, a, that's obviously a big advantage. Uh, of course, one of the things that happened, if you know about it, was the Luftwaffe began uh, kind of an aerial campaign of London where they tried to bomb the, the cities of London. Uh, and so a lot, a lot of a lot of areas of London, uh, they had the so-called Blitz that happened, if you know about it, the Blitz, uh, where uh, for about, I know for like, I think for a while, for like 57 days in a row, if you know about this, uh, the Germans bombed Britain. Uh, during the Battle of Britain, uh, which the <clears throat> British called the Blitz, uh, if you know about that. And somewhere like maybe 45,000 range, I think is what it was, but they had something like that amount of British that were killed, basically, uh, in that whole uh, part of the war. And something like 2 million buildings were destroyed or damaged, you can see. So totally destructive. Uh, they didn't just go after London, they went after you know other cities that were kind of in Southern England, uh, primarily, and so a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, like in London, they had to actually evacuate to either their basements, maybe, uh, but a lot of them also had to evacuate into like the subways of London uh, as well. So you can see the destruction that a lot of these German bombs did uh, as their aircraft, you know, attacked them. Here's some images of like the people evacuating to, of course, the tube or the uh, British London, London subway. Uh, the only thing that would happen, if you know about with, um, of course, the uh, Battle of Britain, the Germans suffered a lot of losses. Like, I think over 2,500 aircraft were actually lost trying to bomb Britain. Uh, and so it forced Hitler to give up, if you know about that on the war with invading Britain. And so uh, they were going to come back later and defeat Britain, but it never came about because the Germans got bogged down uh, in Eastern Europe uh, with the invasion of the Soviet Union. So that's the other thing, of course, I'm going to talk about today, uh, which really uh, is considered like a major turning point, of course, in, in you know World War II, is Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, which you can see here. Uh, it started in June of 1941. Uh, they actually have a code name for it, uh, which is called Operation Barbarossa. It's named after a famous uh, German king uh, of Holy Roman Empire, Frederick Barbarossa. You know about that. It was considered, by the way, one of the largest invasions in history. Uh, actually, they think somewhere between like some like 4 million troops uh, were involved. Uh, mostly German with some of their Axis power allies were, were, in, were in it too. Uh, and um, the plan was to defeat the Soviet Union in a short war. So it wasn't supposed to last, you know, several years, 1941-45. Uh, in fact, the Soviet Union was supposed to fall in six months. Hitler really thought that the Soviet Union was weak. Uh, and uh, what was his motivations? You can see there he wanted, to, obviously, to conquer their land. You know, Lebensraum to settle there, um, things like that. Uh, but um, he also wanted a lot of their mineral sources, like you know, oil, 
uh, probably a lot of the grain that's in like Ukraine uh, as an example. And uh, <clears throat> the Germans gave it a nickname. But the, they, if, this, if you know about this, began the so-called Eastern Front uh, in the war, well, which was really the bloodiest front in World War II. Uh, something like 30 million uh, men, women, et cetera, would die in World War II, uh, you know, on both sides combined. And the Soviets would later call it the Great Patriotic War uh, because the fact that uh, in, uh, I think, the war against Napoleon in 1812, uh, they called it the Patriotic War. And so they called World War II uh, the Great Patriotic War, uh, fighting against, you know, fascism. I can see other images here. So Hitler declares war on Russia uh, at that point, which Stalin, by the way, was shocked. He couldn't believe that, you know, that uh, Hitler would you know, invade uh, the Soviet Union because they had this, you know, pact with them, you know, neutrality pact that they signed back in 1939. Uh, you can see here that uh, the uh, Soviet forces at first were no match uh, for the German forces. Back in several months, uh, the German forces basically overran Eastern Europe. Uh, they took the rest of Eastern Poland. Uh, they seized the Baltic states. Uh, Finland, which had been fighting, you know, uh, the Soviets in that winter war, uh, continued their war uh, with, with the Soviets, the so-called continuation war, I think is what they called it. And so Finland joined up with the Germans to fight the Soviets. Uh, they took Belarus. They would seize the Ukraine uh, as well, uh, the Germans. And they also would push into Western uh, Russia uh, as well. Uh, they do think as the Germans went into Eastern Europe, they did start the Holocaust. Is something if you know about this, uh, they began rounding up Jews uh, and other people that were against the Germans, and they killed them. They shot them. Sometimes they gassed them uh, as well. And the Germans had these uh, SS killing squads that went around called Eitzit Grouping. Grouping you see there uh, in. Uh, they basically went around killing not just Jews, but uh, communists, uh, any kind of partisans that were fighting behind enemy lines. Uh, they had them killed. And they think somewhere between one to two million people were killed by the Nazis uh, with the Eitz and Gruppen. So they're kind of notorious. So you can see on the left that must be Jews. They're shooting in the back of the head uh, right there. Uh, that kind of really begins the whole Holocaust uh, later. Uh, you can kind of see a map of Eastern Europe, too. Uh, you can see how the Germans push eastward. Uh, one thing that does happen, which is famous uh, at the beginning, of course, of Bar uh, Operation Barbarossa, uh, the Siege of Leningrad occurred, uh, which occurs really between 1941 uh, up to, like, I want to say 1944. Last, like, 800-some days. Uh, and it was the longest siege of World War II. Uh, and... Uh, what happened was they were caught between the Finns in the north, you see there, uh, and the Germans in the south. Uh, and so they, they couldn't basically break out. It was very difficult. And so over a million Soviet citizens actually died there. They, a lot of them starved to death because they couldn't get supplies in. Here's kind of another image you can see right here. But you can see uh, how they encircled Leningrad, which is St. Petersburg. Uh, but the Germans never could take it. That could have been a blow, you know, if they could have taken that city, uh, you know, in, in the war. But it was one of those cities that the Germans never seized, of course, uh, in the war. Uh, they do have the Battle of Moscow. That was considered a very pivotal battle, by the way, uh, at the beginning of the Eastern Front. Uh, what happened was uh, at the end of 1941, the Soviets counterattacked and they pushed the Germans back uh, and prevented them from taking Moscow, which, you know, Germans were trying to drive on Moscow, kind of like, I guess, Napoleon did uh, in 1812. Uh, and uh, part of why that happened was apparently uh, Stalin was able to get reinforcements from the Far East because uh, I think there was a brief skirmish between Japan uh, and the Soviet Union, uh, but the Soviets had defeated them. Uh, and so uh, the Soviets were able to send force to the Far East, and they used that as reinforcements to push the Germans back. And it caused the, the basically the Eastern Front to basically stall. So at that point between 1941-42, neither side can really win the war at that point. And so uh, the Eastern Front is going to be basically 
a major turning point in World War II. Uh, eventually, in 1942-43, uh, the Germans will begin losing, uh, especially at the Battle of Stalingrad, I'll get to later. And that's going to be a major reason why the Nazi Germany collapses, of course, in 1945. So really, really the whole, the whole you know, uh, Eastern Front, you know, Operation Barbarossa, the, the, the failure of it really uh, is what causes why Nazi Germany loses World War II uh, overall. So it wasn't meant to fight, you know, six months or whatever. It was supposed to be that amount, you know, six months, or whatever, and it turns into several years. Now, I'm going to move on next. I want to, of course, talk about the fact that the United States, of course, also gets in the war, which that that's a very important event. The entering of really the United States uh, at the end of 1941 is really considered the big turning point uh, in the war. I think if like Germany had only had to fight the Soviet Union, I think that probably the, the Germans could have won the war, uh, you know, but with the United States, with the British fighting the Soviets, that's obviously a major reason why, of course, why, of course, the Axis powers lost the war. Uh, so um, I'll get to it later, but part of why the United States enters World War II is the fact that Japan attacks Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, uh, you know, in Hawaii. So that that's why pretty much we get in the war. I'll talk more about that later, but I'm going to talk about, you know, why the fact that, you know, Japan you know, causes this later because, you know, that wasn't the main reason at first why that happened. They just attack us and all that. I want to get into, of course, and talk about the fact that the United States entered the war because of the fact that the Japanese, you know, were starting to get more aggressive, of course, in the war world. Um, a lot of it was primarily because of the fact that Japan became this fascist state, totalitarian state, uh, really, between the wars, between World War One uh, and World War Two, you get the so-called Rising Sun. They sometimes call it. Where uh, between the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, Japan starts to take over parts of Asia uh, and also the Pacific. Uh, don't forget, most of it occurs under uh, their emperor named Emperor Hirohito. I'll talk about. And also, they have a prime minister and war minister who was kind of important, Hideki Tojo. He had a lot to do with it uh, as well. And uh, at the time, uh, the leader, of course, of um, of Japan was this emperor named Emperor Hirohito, who was also called, I think his other name is Emperor uh, Showa, is what the actual Japanese called him. And he uh, came to the throne in the 1920s. Uh, and if you know about uh, Emperor Hirohito, he was considered one of the longest reigning monarchs uh, in the world. I think top 10 overall. He reigned like 62 years while he was in power. A lot of people don't know this about Hirohito, but under his regime, they killed more people than Hitler did. They did. Because in, you know what? In China, they killed like 10 million Chinese or more more uh, during the war. Uh, and um, they kept him in power. He was back, I think, in power until 1989 uh, in Japan. And I think he's the only emperor in the world uh, that's still left. But like the Japanese emperor... So the only one that goes by that you know title uh, today now, but um, anyway, uh, but if you know about it, Hirohito was kind of worshipped uh, like a god type emperor, uh, and so a lot of the Japanese fought to the death, you know, like suicidal and things like that when they fought fought against the Allies, like the British and of course the Americans, uh, etc. Uh, here's kind of a map showing you the Japanese, but yeah, the Japanese uh, at one point. Uh, which control different parts of the world. Uh, and uh, part of why Japan became this imperial power, if you know about it, was because there's it's really different reasons for it. I'll kind of give you, but part of it was the Great Depression. Uh, the Great Depression had really made Japan suffer economically. Uh, they lacked natural resources. Japan didn't have things like, you know, rubber. Uh, they didn't have like a lot of oil, wood, and things like that. Uh, and so um, that was one thing. Rise of militarism, rise of, you know, Japanese national. The Japanese thought that they were superior to other Asians. They even thought they were superior to, like, Westerners, uh, you know, foreign, foreign imperialists that were trying to come in. And so Japan wanted to be like these other foreign powers uh, and be like, like an empire uh, overall. And um, 
In fact, Japan envisioned this empire, which would be like an empire for Asians, uh, they called it, where they would control Asia uh, and the Pacific, uh, where they'd be on top and all the other Asians would be on the bottom and they would kick all the four, like Europeans out, Americans out. And uh, they called it later the Great East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere is what they called it. So Asia for Asians uh, with Emperor Hirohito ruling over it, uh, et cetera. So Japanese were very racist, uh, xenophobic. Uh, they don't like foreigners, uh, things like that. And they still kind of are like that today a little bit uh, overall. Uh, here's kind of a map showing it. But uh, Japan, uh, if you know about it, fought this war against Russia, uh, the Russo-Japanese War between 1904 and 1905. They fought primarily to control Korea uh, and also uh, Manchuria uh, there. And so that's going to be important because it's going to allow eventually Japan to control those areas. Uh, Japan also controlled Taiwan uh, for, for many years. So that's how the, the Japanese uh, end up getting into Manchuria because the Russians at one point had a sphere of influence uh, over that. But because the Russian Empire is declining, uh, Japan's able to control Korea and Manchuria. Uh, so that, that's one thing we're going to get into next uh, and talk about. Of course, I'll get into the Second Sino-Japanese War. Before that happened, though, uh, if you go back to this map, uh, which I think is right here, um, I don't know that map shows you right here, but one thing that did happen that's interesting back in 1931, the Japanese took over Manchuria because uh, the fact that Russia in the east, far east, was kind of weak. Uh, and um, they took those areas because it was a huge area, by the way, that had a lot of natural resources. Uh, Russia had been kind of a controlling interest there, but after the Russo-Japanese War, uh, Japan was able to control it. And they created a Japanese puppet state there called Manchuko. Uh, and so they are able to control that uh, and... Uh, Korea, uh, which is right below. And uh, they wanted that area because of the fact that Manchuria was rich in a lot of natural resources like oil, rubber, lumber, uh, and things like that. And that's an area we're talking about that's the size of like something like California, Oregon, Washington, like the western part of the United States. And so uh, that enabled them to control that area. And of course, it led to a deterioration, if you know about this, of relations between the Japanese uh, and the Chinese. And so it led to this conflict they call later the Second Sino-Japanese War, uh, which broke out uh, in 1937, which, of course, I'm going to talk about next, uh, which they consider that, by the way, to be one of the longest conflicts uh, in, really, World War II. Uh, put that back up on the screen, but uh, it lasts from 1937 uh, to 1945, like eight years. And it was pretty bloody. Uh, they, people don't really talk much about that, but I forget different numbers on the actual casualties of that of that you know front in the war. But 10, 20 million at least, I think, died in the war on both sides combined. Which I think, I think the Chinese deaths in the war was somewhere 10, 15 million, maybe more, uh, that died. So yeah, because of Hirohito's policies, you know, like I said, all these Japanese, uh, of course, were killed in the war. Uh, Japan, of course, what happened, they invaded the eastern part of China and they took over like the capital of the Republic of China at the time, which was Nanjing, uh, which is which is I'll talk about later. Uh, Beijing was also seized, which is now the capital of China or Peking. Shanghai was also seized. And so was Hong Kong, which the British controlled initially before. And so all those areas were taken by the Japanese and they talk, the armies that fought there uh, in uh, Japan were known as the Kwantung Army, and they were known for committing a lot of atrocities. They didn't really follow Geneva Accords uh, in like warfare, <clears throat> and so they were known for you know killing a lot of people, like soldiers and civilians. And uh, they're notorious for the rape of Nanjing or Nanking that occurred in December of 1937 when uh, the Japanese forces took the capital uh, of the Republic of China. And uh, they took the people uh, that were there, mostly civilians, and they butchered them, uh, which 
They're not sure how many it was, but they think somewhere between 40 to maybe 300,000 people may have been killed uh, by the Japanese armies. And you can see images like on the right uh, there. Uh, it was considered like almost like a forgotten Holocaust because uh, of the fact that, you know, it was kind of really covered up, you know, after the war. Uh, and I think later there was a famous book by Iris Chang. I think it came out several years ago called The Rape of Nan King, uh, which went more into the historical ramifications of it and all that. But today, I think the Japanese are still kind of, they don't want to talk about it, uh, what, what happened with this and all the atrocities that the uh, Japanese are kind of known for. And they even like would bayonet people. They would just, you know, kill them like that. Uh, or I think there's a case where they even cut their heads off. They take samurai swords and they would execute uh, soldiers, civilians uh, in, in that manner. They even did that to uh, allied, uh, I think allied POWs, like British, American uh, POWs were even executed in that fashion uh, as well. So they would torture people and things like that. And they didn't really follow like Geneva conventions of war uh, that are kind of, you know, known later. Uh, there was also a case which was controversial, if you know about it, where they took women, like Chinese uh, women and other types of Asian women, Korean or whatever, and they actually forced them to become prostitutes, if you know about this. Uh, and they were called comfort women, is what they were called. So that's another thing that's kind of controversial about uh, the Japanese occupation of parts of, of Asia, the Pacific. Uh, here's kind of a map showing it, but I'll get to it later. But the United States will come in and help the British and other Dutch, Australians fight, of course, uh, against the Japanese. But uh, the whole theater of where they're fighting in is, is obviously from China all the way to Burma, Thailand, and then into the Pacific uh, overall. Uh, now, of course, one thing that's very famous, the U.S. Uh, will support uh, the head of the Republic of China, uh, which was Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, he was known by the title Generalissimo. Uh, he was kind of like a general and president. Uh, after the war, he would be the president of China uh, as well. And so uh, the United States, along with the British, uh, supported him with you know supplies and forces uh, to fight against Japan uh, in the war. And uh, he was very pro-American. I think he was even... I think he was somewhat educated and was actually a, a, a Methodist, <laughs> believe it or not. He was a Christian. Um, oh, and the U.S. would even, we and along with the British, would try to supply uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, and his forces. Uh, they have what they call the, um, it's called the China-Burma-India Theater, they dubbed it. And what happened was the Allies began supplying um, the Chinese with, uh, whatever kind of uh, weaponry and, and food sources that they need, you know, fuel and things like that. And so uh, between uh, 19, uh, really 1940, 41 to uh, 19, um, I think 40, I want to say 45 was the peak of it. Uh, for about 42 months, uh, the British uh, and U.S. flew air missions, uh, sorties uh, from like India, uh, to China, uh, which was known as the hump. when They, they had to fly over the Himalayas to basically get uh, into China. And they supplied something like 650,000 tons of supplies uh, in like a 42-month period, so which is about, about three and a half years or so. Uh, and it was all part of the so-called China-Burma-India theater. Uh, because if you know about the Japanese cut the Burma Road, uh, which is kind of a, kind of a problem, uh, and so they had to go by air uh, to supply them so they couldn't supply them by road. Uh, there was a case where uh, the American side uh, sent volunteers over there uh, to fight with the Chinese Air Force in 1941. Uh, they were known as the Flying Tigers, uh, which were headed up by this general, uh, American general named Claire Chenault. Uh, Claire Chenault was from uh, Waterproof, Texas, uh, and uh, he went to Louisiana State University uh, prior to World War II, uh, where he attended for like, I think, one year uh, in college. And uh, so he's one headed the Flying Tigers. Uh, and uh, he's one that kind of coined the name because of the fact that LSU is known as the Fighting Tigers. 
So it's kind of where the name comes from. But the Flying Tigers was also known as the American Volunteer Group. Uh, they were basically these volunteer pilots that went over there uh, to fight. And um, several several Flying Tigers were well known. You may have heard of Tex Winter. Tex Winter uh, was from Texas. Uh, he was well known. Uh, Robert Scott was another famous Flying Tiger uh, who uh, later wrote a book about his experiences in the Flying Tigers called God is My Co-Pilot. Uh, they also had Gregory uh, Boeington, who went by the name Pappy, Pappy Boeington, uh, who later afterwards fought in the Pacific with the U.S. Marines. Uh, they had their own Marine squadron they called, called the Black Sheep Squadron. That's well, well known. I think they made a TV show out of it one time, I remember. And he wrote a book, too. Like, Pappy Boeington had a autobiography he wrote called Baba ba Black Sheep, uh, describing it. So flying tigers were kind of important. Uh, they helped the uh, Chinese Air Force fight the Japanese because uh, the Chinese Air Force was not very good. Uh, the flying tigers, funny, uh, they had P-40 Warhawks, uh, which was a type of uh, airplane, a uh, fighter, fighter plane that was used a lot uh, in that part of the world. And uh, the flying tigers had about 90 planes. Uh, total with three squadrons. And they all had different nicknames. Uh, the Flying Tigers were called, uh, I think they had one squadron called the Adam and Eves, uh, another one called the Panda Bears. And they had a third one, it's very interesting. It was called the Hell's Angels, which is where the motorcycle gang got its nickname later. But the big thing, of course, to talk about today uh, is the, uh, of course, attack on Pearl Harbor. The attack on Pearl Harbor is really the main thing that really got uh, the United States really in the war. Uh, a lot of it was because of the fact that Japan uh, was in China uh, and the United States you know, wanted to get them out. And uh, what happened was the president of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, began to put sanctions on Japan, which uh, one of the main things they did, if you know about it, was they put an embargo uh, on Japan where they couldn't sell certain things to, to them for their war machines. I know the main thing they banned was fuel, uh, oil shipments, uh, scrap metal and steel. Uh, they couldn't send them those kind of things. And then they even froze a lot of the Japanese like assets in banks and things like that to kind of, I guess, force them out of China. Uh, and uh, they think the attack on Pearl Harbor was something that the Japanese began pl planning months before. One of these kind of did out of nowhere. It was planned over several months. And uh, they think the Imperial Japanese Navy was the main arm of the Japanese military that planned it. And the main man, behind, the brainchild behind it was Admiral Yamamoto. You know about him. Uh, he was the guy that really, really was the influence behind it. They think that the uh, Japanese were influenced by this battle you may have heard of called the Battle of Toronto, uh, which was actually an air battle where uh, the British used um, aircraft carriers to attack the Italian fleet in southern Italy. They used, like, torpedo bombers. And so this kind of gave the Japanese an idea to use torpedo bombers and bombers to attack the main, you know, fleet, Pacific fleet, of course, of the United States. So the main goal of Pearl Harbor uh, was to eliminate or weaken basically the U.S. Pacific fleet, which was based in Hawaii. If they could, you know, eliminate that, or neutralize it, uh, that would force the United States to capitulate uh, in a short war. And so I think they were kind of trying to do like they did against the Russians, the Russo-Japanese War you know, back in 1904, 1905, and that's the idea behind it. So here's kind of a thing kind of, kind of showing right here. So yeah, a lot of it was like aggression, you know, suffered between each, uh, Japan and America, you know, pretty much our foreign relations were kind of weakening at that point uh, between them. Uh, and um, you can see here that the, that the Japanese would try to attack Pearl Harbor. And I think it was a case where they think they could take Hawaii and they could, you know, knock us out of the war at that point. So, yeah, there's Yamamoto. He was really the man brainchild really behind the whole attack on Pearl Harbor uh, at that point. Uh, they think probably Hideki Tojo was also involved, too, uh, who by that time was, I think, the prime minister of Japan. Uh, there's a debate about whether Hirohito knew about it or not. They're not sure. 
but it's still kind of trying to figure that out about whether he knew or not. Uh, here, of course, was the main target. Uh, basically, uh, if you know about what happened, uh, the Japanese amassed a huge naval task force which used aircraft carriers, which I think they had like something like six aircraft carriers uh, that were in it uh, that was called the First Air Fleet. Uh, those are all the different aircraft carriers that were used uh, to attack Pearl Harbor uh, and Hawaii, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, Hiryu, Shukaku, and Zukaku. Uh, and um, their main targets were really uh, several things in Oahu, Hawaii. Uh, they wanted to go after the airfields, but you can see the main thing uh, that they went after was really Battleship Row. Uh, Battleship Row, uh, if you can see it uh, right there, it's kind of east of Ford Island. Uh, that's where the U.S. had its main capital ships. U.S. is Oklahoma, Maryland, Utah, California, West Virginia, Tennessee, Nevada, and Arizona. Uh, people didn't put much into aircraft carriers at that time, at the beginning of, of the war. And so that's what the Japanese went after mostly. And then they took out our airfields also as well. And so, yeah, you can see there were actually two waves of attack planes that came in uh, from the Japanese first air fleet. First wave came in about 755, and the second wave came in about 854. First wave did majority of the destruction uh, at Pearl. Uh, and uh, here's kind of a map showing you a picture of Battleship Row. Battleship Row, I believe, is on the bottom right there uh, where all the ships are kind of lined up uh, in Pearl Harbor. And uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor caused something like 18 ships to be either damaged or destroyed. Uh, close to 2,500 men uh, were also killed, which were mostly U.S. sailors uh, that were killed. Most of them were killed on two ships, USS Arizona uh, and the Oklahoma, which both those ships, by the way, uh, were destroyed uh, in the actual attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, here's kind of some images, but the Arizona, probably the most famous ship, of course, uh, at Pearl Harbor, uh, it was totally destroyed uh, in the attack. Uh, some like 80% of the crew uh, were actually killed. Uh, they think a bomb hit the actual magazine and it caused the whole ship to explode. It actually came out of the water when it blew up. Uh, and... Um, and of course, it burned afterwards, I think, until Christmas time. It was actually burning uh, for several weeks uh, afterwards. Uh, something like, uh, they think maybe almost like 1,200 men uh, were actually killed on the Arizona. And I don't know if you know about, of course, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, they have a ship here you may have heard of uh, called, called the USS Kidd. Uh, it's named after Isaac W. Kidd. Uh, the Arizona was actually his flagship. He was a rear admiral, and he was killed on the bridge when the ship blew up, uh, and they never found him. He, he got blown to smithereens, uh, and so they started naming all these ships after him. The USS Kid in Baton Rouge, of course, the first ship named after him. So that's why Baton Rouge wanted that ship, because it was connected to Pearl Harbor uh, and all that. Uh, here's other images also showing. I'll kind of blow this up here, but... Uh, yeah, there, of course, is the USS Arizona Memorial. Uh, it was founded in 1962 uh, on top of the remnants. Uh, you can see the Arizona on the bottom there, that what's left of the, I guess, the keel of it right there. And uh, they, they actually have oil still coming out of it, which some people joke that it's the, the tears of the sailors that are dead, you know, that, that are coming out. Uh, I think two million people visit it, you know, annually every year. Uh, there's the Oklahoma on the right. Uh, it actually almost turned turtle, like almost turned on its keel, uh, just about, about, I think 500 men, I think, died in the Oklahoma. To kind of give you an idea of uh, amount of men there uh, as well. They never floated the Oklahoma. By, it actually, they actually raised it right there. You can see the Oklahoma like right above the USS Wisconsin. But you can see these later battleships uh, like the Wisconsin, Iowa, and others, Missouri, are way bigger battle wagons compared to like those those actual ships. But yeah, here's another image that's kind of famous. It was a, I think it's a destroyer called the USS Shaw. It was actually hit by a bomb and it blew up and uh, considered the worst fireball, I think, that actually occurred uh, at the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th. 
Uh, of course, what happened in the end, uh, if you know about it, then the United States uh, the next day uh, declared war uh, on uh, Japan. Of course, the famous FDR Day of Infamy speech on December 8th, uh, we declared war, of course, on Japan. And so because of that, you know, what ends up happening is Japan, Germany, Italy, they all declare war on us uh, afterwards uh, by December you know, 11th. And so you've got now all these different powers that are fighting each other uh, in the war. And uh, that was considered to be, by the way, one of the most famous speeches probably ever given uh, in, in World War II. Uh, the Day of Infamy speech, of course, by him. And I'll share that with you before I go, uh, of course, that speech. Uh, but that's how the United States, you know, gets in the war. That's how the war kind of changes at that point in 1941 with, you know, United States, uh, Soviet Union entering the war, of course. Uh, and that's going to be part of why Germany loses. Uh, the Axe powers lose World War II is because of all these different powers that enter the war. So, um, but anyway, um, before I go, I did want to remind you, of course, I will later in the week, I'll kind of continue with, like, I'll have a part two lecture coming up, uh, which uh, part two lecture tomorrow, I'll kind of talk about how um, the, Ax the Axis powers start losing the war. 1942 is really considered to be the turning point, of course, of World War II. Uh, and so uh, I'll kind of get into that, and we'll talk about the end of the war by 1945. Uh, before I go, I did want to remind you about, um, like, the different assignments that are out there uh, that y'all need to know about. Um, we, go, of course, got the British quiz uh, that's still out. Uh, I think I'm going to probably give you a few more days on it. I'll kind of look at that today. Uh, but the second exam, that's the main thing you'll need to work at this week and get that up out the way. Uh, I think that's due by Friday, I want to say. Uh, third vocab is also due by Friday uh, as well. Uh, those are probably your two big things you'd work on. And then the World War I quiz, uh, you also need to work on uh, and get that out the way as well. Because I think that's the last two quizzes we got left uh, before the final. Final, of course, next week, uh, which will be on World War I, uh, Rise of Fascism in World War II. And I told you that the Cold War era, I'm probably going to have some recorded lectures on that. Uh, which will really be a, like a bonus thing. I'll do like extra credit uh, for, for you later. So uh, anyway, uh, I don't think I've got any questions today. Uh, but before I go, I did want to share with you, of course, uh, the Day of Infamy speech, of course, by uh, FDR. It's kind of a famous speech, uh, which is well, and I kind of add some video to it, but I'll kind of share that with you. It's only like about two minutes long. It's a very short speech, one of the shortest speech in American history, but it's very, very famous. So I'll share it before y'all go. So y'all take care. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire.